Hello, Dan. My name is Philippa Rowland. Um, I'm wondering whether you could introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers in Adelaide and beyond. Yeah, I'd be happy to, Philippa. Dan Van Holst Pelican. I'm the member for Stuart, which is the electorate of uh, Kapunda on up to the Northern Territory, including Port Augusta, and I'm also the Shadow Minister for Regional Development. Right, that's quite a large area you're actually therefore representing. Yeah, it is, and, and it's it's a fantastic area. I love it. It's got a little bit of the Riverland in it, uh, the, the Mid-North, mm. uh, an enormous part of outback South Australia, and a, a very, very wide range of communities. About half the population is Port Augusta, and about half the population is 30 other towns. Wow. We've invited you along today to explain to us about the select inquiry into solar thermal in, in Port Augusta, but I thought it'd be valuable if you could just give us a bit of background about Port Augusta and the power stations there. Okay, well, uh, I mean, the power stations there are very, very important to the town from an employment perspective. Uh, there are two power stations there, Northern and Playford power stations. Playford, uh, unfortunately, is one of the most polluting power stations in the nation. And I think everybody, regardless of what your, your, your view on these issues is, everybody understands that it must close down. It's important to say also that it's actually a Linter Energy who, who own and operate these facilities. So they are a key, key player in anything that, that happens here in Port Augusta with regard to this issue. Um, these two power stations provide between 30 and 40 percent of the state's electricity. Northern Power Station runs, or well, has historically you know, run mm. all of the time, and Playford has been a backup power station on and off when necessary. Mm. But recently, Northern has actually been offline for maintenance and other, other reasons as well. But one of the really important things to get across is that through these power stations, there are actually 500 jobs in our part of the world, about 250 in Port Augusta directly uh, with the power station and about 250 at Lee Creek in the coal mine. Okay. But I, I suppose one of the issues before people is, is twofold. One is the fact that the coal at Lee Creek is running out and the second that there's a process of transition going on around Australia in looking at moving us away from fossil fuels. Uh, there is this process that's very important and should continue to happen. And I think one of the things that makes this a golden opportunity for us is that we know that the coal at Lee Creek is going to run out. So we need a solution to what we're going to do for power generation in Port Augusta anyway. Anywhere from five to 35 years are the estimates I've been given, but I think it's probably pretty fair to say that the workable, useful life is is 10 to 15 years. Mm. Um, so that creates an opportunity. Uh, it, it's a threat to the town of Lee Creek, of course, and I'm, and I'm always, always mindful of that because that's a very important community in its own right. And it also supports the whole northeast of the outback of South Australia in much the same way that Cooper Pedy does for the northwest. Well, Dan, now might be the moment just to ask you to explain a little bit about the process of the select inquiry and why you thought that was a good way forward. Okay. Um, as you'd know, Philippa, there's a, there's a, a huge range of, of views out there already on, on solar thermal and renewables in general. I mean, there are some people who, who are ardent for and against, uh, and it's important. I think it's only fair for me to say I don't consider myself to be an environmental campaigner. I consider myself to be a very responsible person, and any responsible person should be doing everything they possibly can to, to reduce and ideally get rid of pollution. That, that's where my head's at at the moment. Then you overlay that with a, with a role as a Member of Parliament uh, and representing Port Augusta. So the reason I got this select committee put together is because I wanted to raise the profile of this issue, put this issue on the, on the, the, the statewide radar, but number two, and more importantly for me, it, it, it gave the opportunity to have a very serious, very thorough, funded inquiry to really try and establish the bona fides of the proposal. Mm. The issue is currently centre stage and in focus for people both in Canberra and in yep. South Australia. Yep. Sure. And sometimes one does have occasions that inquiries lead to things going off the boil while people be beaver away behind closed doors. Okay. And so I'd just like a bit of a perspective on time frames yep, and sure. process. Yep, sure. Really, really important question. Okay, first of all, the, the, the terms of reference, I mean, they're, they're publicly available, but essentially what they say is, let's investigate this proposal, solar thermal for Port Augusta. Uh, let's consider what would it cost to, to actually build it and implement it. 
is it really cost-effective production of electricity and what would it mean for retail electricity prices for households and businesses? What are the job implications? And very, very importantly, is it a proven, reliable form of producing electricity? Mm. They're, they're really the key things that are there in the terms of reference. Um, and I'll be thrilled to death if it passes the test mm. uh, f for many reasons, but you couldn't expect taxpayers' funds to go towards such a major, major expense if it hasn't actually passed some tests too. So very mm. clearly, I want it to be successful, but I can't support it until I know that it has jumped these hurdles. So, mm. um, so you know, that, that's why I framed it that way. My attitude is uh, so many people have told me that it's reliable, that it's proven, that yep. it works. I don't know that. If it's the case, it'll be very easy to prove. It'll yep. be very, very easy. Uh, I expect that there'll be two members of the five-person committee who will actually go overseas and try and get that information directly. I don't actually anticipate having the opportunity to do that myself. But there'll be two people, um, I expect, who will do exactly that, to go to one of these places, maybe two of them, and bring that information home. Mm. Because to me, that, that's not about opinions. I mean, it either is reliable or it's not. It's yeah. proven or it's not. Yeah. Uh, you know, we can make value judgments and opinions about whether the cost is worth it. That's a different, different category. But, uh, you know, it, it is either technically proven to have worked overseas or it's not. So uh, people who believe that's the case should be very comfortable that it'll pass that yeah, test. Yeah, no, enormously. I'm speaking on behalf of the Repower Port Augusta Alliance, yep. which I shouldn't be doing as an interviewer, but just briefly to set the, the scene from that perspective, that the bottom line, I believe, for the Alliance is that we'd like to see solar thermal with storage built. Yep. And that's because what you now see is the capacity of solar to really come into the frame with an ability with storage capacity to deliver dispatchable energy, yes. which quite changes the scenario from just having PV panels on a domestic yep. rooftop. Yep. You're starting to bring things up to scale so that they can provide large-scale electricity production, but also give you the flexibility that we've traditionally only thought about coming from a gas plant, not from a solar plant. You talk about dispatch capacity. Uh, I mean, that, that, to me, that's the heart of renewables. If somehow, uh, you know, we had batteries, we had storage capacity and dispatch capacity, I mean, that, we all know that's the bottom line. There's, n there's no difficulty these days harnessing mm. and creating instant energy. It's that overnight or when the tide's not running or when the wind's not blowing or any of those other things, yeah. ability to store it. Now, mm. you know, concentrated solar thermal is a technology that people believe can do that at least for a 24-hour cycle. Yeah. And that's why it might be what we're looking for. Yeah, quite valuable. So back to the inquiry. Yep. And what's the time frame? Okay. Uh, you're quite right. And, and I too uh, can be cynical uh, about the timing of these things. We're actually quite fortunate in the sense that we have an election coming in South Australia, March 2014. Mm. So this inquiry must be done before Parliament pulls up stumps in the very end of November, beginning of December, 2013. So essentially we've got one year to do this work. Is that a definite date or that's a likely date that you'd have to be finished by? Well it's got to be done before then because Parliament's dissolved in yes. advance of the election yes. before then. So if we don't get this work done by then, yes. the committee's dissolved regardless. Yes. Uh, and I know from our first meeting everybody has a, a, a will to make that happen. Yeah. My hesitation in asking you the next question probably related from my understanding that actually getting Australia's first concentrating solar thermal with storage plant built is going to require uh, a funding partnership between a company, state and federal government yep. to get it up. Yep. And while we have a state election coming up in 2014, we also have a federal election yep. coming up probably in November. So I guess that's just uh, a comment that there is then a state federal layer of a window of opportunity that, that may be shorter than you think from a state perspective. Sure, um, but, but I suppose it's important to then talk about what can the committee do. Yeah. The committee will report to Parliament yeah. on the terms of reference. The committee's not going to build no, a solar sure. thermal plant. The, the committee's not going to make it happen. Yeah. The committee aims to provide information through a thorough inquiry 
uh, including you know as, as much external information as we can possibly get. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not going to be just five MPs getting a room and haggling no. out together. You've got funding as, for as, as much opportunity mm-hmm. as possible to talk to witnesses from far and wide to produce a report to the South Australian Parliament. Now, that information will be publicly available for anybody else who wants it. Mm-hmm. It will then be up to the government to decide what it does with that information. So we we can't make this thing happen. Mm-hmm. But what we can do, and, 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 and my goal in this part of, of, of the process, is to get that information to mm-hmm. the government so that there's a really, really clear message mm-hmm. on those terms of reference. Now, then the government, both state and federally, as you quite rightly point out, and also, uh, you know, big business, you know, Alinta being very involved, but no doubt there'd have to be other external funding partners, mm-hmm. uh, both from a, from a, you know, a, a banking financial world, but also from an environmental world. I mean, as, as you know, there are funds that can be accessed uh, for, for all sorts of purposes. Mm-hmm. It'll be, it won't be this committee that decides whether it goes ahead. But what I want to do is get that information available so that those decisions mm-hmm. can, be, can be made sooner rather than later. Mm-hmm. If, if, if we think in broad terms that there's sort of 10 to 15 years of life left in the existing power stations at Port Augusta, we need to start now if solar thermal is going to be the thing that can actually fully replace all of the capacity mm. that's currently generated at Port Augusta in 10 or 15 years' time. Yeah. You can't wait till the coal's about to run out. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and my concern is if, if we wait and wait and wait, gas will be the automatic default position because it'll be the only thing that there's time to do. Now, who knows? Uh, I know this doesn't make a lot of people happy. So you see the inquiry as laying the groundwork for making an informed decision. Providing yep. information relatively quickly yep. to decision makers rather than waiting for another three or four or five or six years until they go and seek it from themselves. Yeah. You mentioned uh, taking evidence from a wide, from far and wide. Yes. Can anybody make a submission to the inquiry? Absolutely anybody can. Yeah. Um, the, the so experts from interstate Absolutely. Or internationally, if, if or anybody can make a submission, okay. in fact... Uh, we've actually already advertised calling for submissions. Yeah. We've asked for all submissions to be in by the 21st of December. Mm-hmm. That then gives us a month or so to, to sort of read them, go through them. A working Christmas. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> but that's pretty normal for, for most MPs. But, yeah. but so 21st of December. Yeah. Um, then what happens is people who put submissions in may be invited to then come and give uh, sort of verbal face-to-face evidence to the committee. Mm-hmm. Right. From the perspective of being a first build for Australia and the ramifications that it could have across the country. Yes, very, very important. And, and, and yeah. quite openly, that's one of the most exciting aspects of this. Yeah. I mean, if this, if this works, yeah. right, if it can be proven, if the funding can be sourced and if people get on board and, it, you know, as, as I keep saying, if it passes the tests that are necessary, I mean, this is very, very likely then to start a whole revolution across Australia. And very, very importantly, create a brand new manufacturing industry for Australia. And that's very, very important too. You know, that's, this, is a, this is a golden opportunity in many, many ways, not only to get rid of pollution and not only to find another way of generating you know, affordable, renewable electricity, but it creates a whole other set of jobs and potentially a brand new manufacturing industry. Uh, there are people who, who would be very, very keen to just switch the coal off straight away and you know, build several of these modules straight away, and that's quite understandable. I, I don't expect that that's going to happen. Uh, I think that there's, there's scope to potentially build one of these modules while the coal is still operating, so that you can have a bit of both happening at the same time, and, and then you, 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 you get to prove it up on site. I mean, if mm-hmm. you, you cut the investment down by a sixth or whatever that might be, mm-hmm. uh, you actually get to prove the technology for those people that may still be left doubting on site without having to incur the complete um, you know, expense. You get to slowly transition from one to the other on site. We have a, a highly skilled, large workforce working in coal at the moment who could swap across from coal mm. to solar thermal over time. Yep. It does seem to be a wonderful opportunity to map across from coal thermal to solar yes, thermal. Yes, certainly correct. Because some of the workforce and expertise is going to be maintained because they're working in the same uh, area. Yep. And if, do you think the inquiry will cover 
some of the regional development opportunities that could come from the additional manufacturing. You're talking about the heliostats and other yes, parts. Yes, yeah. I mean, all, yeah, I mean, this is a this is a would would be a brand new industry for Australia. Um, yeah. Obviously, manufacturing you know all of the various components. So. You know that that's a that's a golden opportunity. I think that's a very very important aspect of all Dan, this. Could I could I ask yeah. you? Have you come across and have you thought about tying this to the recent memorandum of understanding, the Upper Spencer Gulf MOU between local, state, and federal government, yeah. which is on regional development? And it's and, and it's a, it's a really good point to raise, Philippa. That that MOU should cover absolutely everything that's going on. Uh, you know, it, there, there'll be a natural fit there. Uh, I don't think they envisaged solar thermal when they were putting their MOU together, but it applies straight away. Yeah. And what do you think of the opportunity costs of not building solar okay. thermal in Port Augusta? Uh, so if you don't go down this track? Again, a really, a really important issue. I mean, if you start at the most basic level, we keep producing a lot of pollution. I mean, yeah. that, that's just a fact. Nobody wants to do that. I mean, the, uh, the, the very, very first... Uh, presentation I ever went to on this was run by Doctors for the Environment and Beyond Zero Emissions, and they were, you know, hand in hand working on this. The health aspects are very, very important, mm. um, and, and that's not been lost on on the, the Port Augusta community. I mean, there are people mm. who, for decades in Port Augusta, have been concerned about power station emissions. Mm. There have been people who have only just started to think about it, and there are some people who are still not concerned. I mean, there's a, there's a wide range yeah. of, of population. But that's a really critical issue. You know, as I said before, any responsible person wants to get away from from creating pollution. So you know that is a cost, uh, but that's a cost that we know is going to stop at some stage when the coal runs out. We will just move to some other technology, whether that's gas, whether that's solar thermal, whatever that happens to be. Now, purely from the uh, you know the, the existing costs uh, to, to to you know the, the community and society more broadly. Obviously, solar thermal is, is uh, really hits the jackpot in that perspective. And gas doesn't, because I think any analysis would show you that both from a health and from an employment and certainly from a greenhouse gas perspective, gas is not innocent. And I think the other long-term perspective is, of course, it ties us into international gas prices. So while the cost at the beginning may appear cheaper when set aside the cost of a new build of solar thermal, um, it can end up costing the earth from getting it from, you know, yeah, moving. and and look again, you, you've hit on a really really important aspect. I mean, some people would say, well, you know, pollution emissions from gas are in between. Some people say, if you consider all of the emissions from gas, you know, fugitive emissions right from the the sourcing of the gas all the way through, uh, it's mm. it's not in between. It's comparable to coal. I can't say that. I don't know that. But the point I wanted to make is, I, I could have suggested an inquiry that looked at all of the potential replacement opportunities for Port Augusta. But that's an inquiry that would have gone on for years and years and years, and we would have ended up investigating a dozen different technologies. And what I chose to do was focus on one, try to crystallise this one issue, try to, 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 to look at that, because then at least we'll get an answer, at least we'll get a report, at least we'll get a recommendation to the South Australian Parliament on that. Well, that means it has the hope of being a solid piece of work Correct. that could really advance forward something we don't currently have in South Australia, in Australia. Correct. And, and that's, you know, my, my approach has very much been, I, I, I don't know that solar thermal is the answer, but I'm determined that it gets the opportunity to prove itself mm. to be the answer. That's, that's very, very much where my head's at. Mm. So just briefly in closing, uh, unless we have more to say, I just wondered what is it along this journey for you as a member for Sturt that's made you so passionate and wanting to push forward with this inquiry? Well, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an environmental campaigner, but, but I'm a campaigner for Port Augusta, right? And yeah. I'm a campaigner for, for responsibility. Everybody knows you've, you've, you've got to reduce pollution. Everybody knows that renewables are the way to go if they work, if they can be harnessed, uh, if they're reliable and if they're affordable. So if you start there, uh, you know, that's a pretty straightforward thing. You have to look into this very seriously. My work in Port Augusta, I mean, that's, that's my home base uh, for, for, for work. You know, it's not the only place in the electorate of Stewart, but it's, it's, it's sort of the, the heart of it. Half the population are there. It's a very important regional centre. Mm. I don't want the coal to close down and then that be the end. And then we lose 500 jobs out of the region too. That's a very important issue. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I want to get rid of the coal, 
but I don't want to get rid of the community benefits through the employment and the economic benefits that the coal produces for Port Augusta and Lee Creek. So again, solar thermal is an example that could replace it in our region because if it's gas, it could very easily end up being some other place where the transmission lines cross a gas pipeline and that's where you put your new gas-fired power station. Now that's not going to be in the best interest of the people that I represent. No. So they could be a shining light of showing how you can actually make a transition from fossil fuel dependence through to having a fully fledged renewable. And, and, and that would be that would be fantastic. And let me say, yeah. I won't get credit for that, right? If if that's the way it goes, yeah. I, I will have done what I can in my role to to open that door to create that opportunity. But you know. People such as yourself and thousands of others have been working on this for for very, very long time, decades in some cases. Mm. You know, Beyond Zero Emissions, Doctors for the Environment came to Port Augusta to put this proposal for us. You know, uh, the the local community got behind it. Repower Port Augusta has Mm. created this. I see myself as a local representative having a really, really important role to say, right, let's, let's see how we can bring all of this together into a focused piece of work that, that will contribute the, the next step along the way. Uh, if we get all the way down the, the, the track where there's solar thermal all over Australia, well, you know, that would be fantastic. It will only happen if it's affordable, if it's reliable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that would be a wonderful outcome. Yeah. One final question. I just wonder whether you've had a lens for looking at this proposal and this whole process that relates to the climate impacts of reliance on fossil fuels and, and coal. Have you looked at risks and long-term impacts yes, in look, Port Augusta? Look, yes, I have. And, and look, I, I, I guess my view is far more micro. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I don't have the knowledge or the background to, to take a, a national view or a worldwide view. I rely on information that's provided to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I, I'm not trying to be too simplistic, but I think if you start with a common sense, responsible approach that says whatever anybody can do to, relu- to reduce pollution is what you should be doing. Now, whether that's you know, recycling your egg cartons at home or whether that's doing your job as a member of parliament to give this proposal and this technology the opportunity to prove itself, that's what people should be doing. Dan Van Host, Pelican. Thanks, yeah, thanks for a, taking oh, a responsible a pleasure for, 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 role in yeah, South Australia. Pleasure. Yep, thanks. Cheers.